بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to the 51st session of Islamic Fiqh explanation book Today we will talk about what is known as the idda the idda al idda and this is maybe well known as the waiting period and this refers to a specific period caused by divorce or by dissolution of the marriage whether through khul' or fasq and it also refers to the waiting period of a widow and these are the two main categories so idda is either resulting from the death of a husband or through the dissolution and the dissolvement and the ending of a marriage there are a number of ayahs in the quran referring to this and the hadiths are also there to explain how this takes place but if we notice that the idda period varies it's not fixed so for a widow generally speaking and also for a woman who was divorced the idda differs whether she's pregnant or not so a pregnant woman has her own idda woman who is not pregnant has a different idda so let us take it step by step why is idda obligated upon women the main reason is to ensure that once a woman is separated from her husband whether through divorce or death that she's not pregnant because what comes after the idda is her legibility to get married again and it would be a very big problem to do so while pregnant then the lineages would mix and this is Islam something that Islam totally prohibits and puts a very high barrier between the two so number one why is Idda mandated the answer would be clearly to ensure that the woman is not pregnant then we may come up with other excuses so one would say in the case of a widow her idda is quite long four months and ten days and we know that one monthly cycle could ensure that she's not pregnant anymore so why is it this way this is something that we're not told in the Quran or in the Sunnah so scholars had to improvise, had to think of what might be a reasonable reason. And they came up with the idea that this is to honor the deceased husband. This is to show his importance in Islam to his wife. And this is something that a lot of the women fail to understand 
the Prophet والسلام, said, if I were to order someone to prostrate to another, I would have ordered a wife to prostrate to her husband. Imagine the magnitude of the role of husband in his wife's life. This was this close for the Prophet to order women to prostrate to their husbands. So in order to highlight this, as in the hadith of Um Habiba, may Allah be pleased with her, she said that the Prophet والسلام, said, it is not lawful for anyone to mourn his deceased or their deceased more than three days. So if my father dies, if my brother dies, if my son dies, I can't mourn them for more than three days. Meaning that, yes, in these three days, I may, may feel sad. I would not wear perfume as a man. I would not want to meet people. I'd like to stay a bit depressed, but not for longer than three days. After that, it's over. You have to attend weddings. You have to resume your normal life. The Prophet said, except for a woman when she mourns her husband for four months and 10 days. So this clearly highlights how important the husband is in the life of his wife and after his death as well. And there is a idda period for a woman who is divorced, a revocable divorce, as we've talked about the divorce in Islam a few episodes back. We said that divorce is three divorces in a marriage. If a man divorces his wife and he would like to revoke the divorce and reconcile with her. He is allowed to do this within the specific period of the Iddah. So the Iddah for a normal woman is three monthly cycles. And why do we make it this long? So that we would give the husband a chance to reconcile with his wife. Imagine if a man divorces his wife, he says, I divorce you. And then 10 minutes later, he's sorry. And I've seen this with my own eyes hundreds of times. In the heat of the argument, the woman says, you're not a man. Divorce me. Divorce me. If you're a man, divorce me. If you don't divorce me, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And she nags him for 10 hours. After that, he, the man is human. He cannot tolerate anymore. So he says, okay, you're divorced. She immediately falls into tears. You don't fear Allah. You divorce me after all these years. And the guy says, you asked for it for 10 hours. I said, yes, but you should not have divorced me. And they both feel remorseful. If Allah were to make this final, life would be unbearable to a lot of the couples. But Allah Azza wa Jal gave them a chance. So the divorce took place today. She is ordered to stay in her home with her husband. If this is the first or the second divorce. Allah says, do not take them out of their houses, meaning after divorce. The man says, Sheikh, I just divorced her. How can I stay with her? He said, well, you have to stay with her the whole period of the idda, which is three monthly cycles. But you don't have any intimacy with her. She's still your wife and you are still her husband. She can see you butt naked and you can do the same, but no intimacy. 
she cooks for you she sleeps on the same bed no intimacy you don't get close to her unless you want to reconcile with her any man and I mean any man within the period of two months if he is following the Sunnah and staying with his divorced wife in the same house sleeping on the same bed a couple of days and they will reconcile this is human nature they'll kiss and make up so Islam promotes this you do the same mistake and you divorce her later on a few years down the line the same pro procedure is to be followed so this three monthly cycles period is for them to reconcile with one another the third divorce takes place that's it it's final and because it's final there is no point in prolonging the idda for three monthly cycles he's not going to be able to revoke the divorce and reconcile with her and there's no point of her staying waiting for two months or more because after with the first cycle we know for certain that she's not pregnant so she can have her freedom and leave afterwards so in general this is the general idea behind the different types of idda now if we would like to go into it in details we find that Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah for example divorce women and divorced women shall wait by themselves for three monthly cycles so this is a woman who's divorced for the first time or for the second time and the man has a chance to reconcile within this period if she gets the third monthly cycle and she gets pure after six or seven days the moment she sees her purity of the third cycle that's it they're no longer husband and wife but before that within the idda period they are husband and wife with conditions that they don't have any intimacy unless they want to reconcile but if one of them dies within the idda period the other one inherits the living one inherits so if the husband dies immediately her idda changes into four months and ten days and she inherits him as a wife if she dies the husband inherits his divorced wife because her idda was not over yet also Allah says in uh, Surah Al-Talaq and those who no longer expect menstruation among your women if you doubt then their period is three months and also for those who have no who have not menstruated and for those who are pregnant their term is until they give birth this ayah has a lot of rulings in it so the rulings as stated in the beginning the rulings are divided into two types whether the woman is pregnant or she is not pregnant let us look at if the woman is pregnant if a woman is pregnant her idda ends with the delivery sheikh this is a lot so it can go up to nine months true and it can be few moments depending when she delivers true can you elaborate I will Allah says in Surah Al Talaq and for those who are pregnant their term that is the idda is until they give birth so in the case of a pregnant woman 
who is in her last days of pregnancy. She has a fight with her husband and the husband says, I divorce you. That was at five o'clock in the afternoon. Five minutes later, she is rushed to the hospital and she gives birth to a baby girl. That was five, let's say 35 in the afternoon. She can get married at 5.36, one minute later, to a totally strange man. Her husband comes to the hospital happy that he's born, that he has a daughter and he sees his wife, whom he divorced half an hour earlier, with another man. He says, what's this? What's this? She says, meet my husband. My father just gave me to him a couple of minutes ago. This is outrageous. How could this be? Well, my friend, you divorced your wife and her idda, due to her pregnancy was to give labor, to, to give birth. Once she gave birth, her idda is over and you're not any longer her husband. And she got married immediately afterwards. Same thing happened with Subay'a al aslamiya may Allah be pleased with her. Subay'a, as Al-Miswar ibn Makhrama says, that she was, or she became a widow. So her husband died a couple of days ago and she gave birth. And men started proposing to her. So it's only been a couple of days or three days from her husband's death. So she was told that no, you can't get married. Nobody can propose to you because you need to wait four months and 10 days. So when she went to the Prophet ﷺ and complained, he gave her permission to get married because her waiting period, instead of being four months and 10 days, was overruled by the ayah, which we've recited twice earlier, stating that her term is over once she delivers. So this is the shortest version of Idda. A woman who's pregnant, she goes into labor. She's admitted to the delivery room. While she's in the delivery room, her husband gets a car crash and dies. And five, ten minutes later, she delivers. She's a free woman. She's not a widow anymore. Which means that though she just gave birth to a baby boy, she's no longer in the waiting period because she gave birth a few minutes after her husband's death. However, she cannot go and wash her husband corpse because he's a stranger to her now the idea is over she's like any other woman if she was still pregnant she could have washed him she could have kissed him while he's dead because he's still her husband due to the fact that she gave birth the relationship is over between them and she can get married the following day, maybe the same day if she wants. This is hypothetical, but it shows you the ins and outs of the Idda. Let's go to scenarios where the pregnant woman's Idda is prolonged. So a man divorces his wife, whether the first, second, or even the third time, while she is in her first, first month pregnancy. So if it's the third and final divorce, she cannot get married until she gives birth. And he's not her husband any longer because it's a third divorce. It's final. 
if it's the first or second divorce, she has to remain in the house until she gives birth after eight months, but no intimacy. And if the husband died and she was not aware that she was pregnant, he dies today, four weeks later she discovers that she's not getting her period, she makes a pregnancy test and the doctor tells her that she's pregnant. She changes her idda from four months and ten days till she gives birth. So she has eight more months to stay in mourning. Not being perfumed, not wearing makeup, not wearing nice fancy clothes that call people to marry her, not leave the house without any legitimate re necessity or uh, a reason, etc. All of this is part of the idda of a pregnant woman. This is out of the way. Now, if the woman is not pregnant, then her idda, usually speaking, is three monthly cycles. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, Divorced women shall wait by themselves for three monthly cycles. So this is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Divorce number one, divorce number two. What about if a woman cannot have monthly cycles? This was also mentioned. Allah says, and those who are or those who no longer expect menstruation among your women. Why? Why don't they expect menstruation? Because they're over 55. So a woman who's over usually 55 years of age, she doesn't have any menses anymore. So Allah says, if you doubt, then the period is three months. Due to the fact that she doesn't have cycles, it turns into months. Only women who are old? No. Allah says, and also for those who have not menstruated. Referring to what? Referring to girls who get married when they're young. Oh, Sheikh, are you talking about child marriage? Yeah, I am talking about child marriage. In the beginning, this was normal among the Arabs. And in, in in Islam came to say that this is something permissible. Nowadays, laws and regulations may restrict that. And this is according to the benefit and according to the judgment of the Muslim ruler. So may, he may delay the marriage age to a certain age according to what he thinks that is best for the community. However, there are women, there are girls, I know personally of one of my relatives who got her monthly cycle when she was just about to turn 18. She never had a monthly cycle in her life and her parents were worried. Well, is she a boy? And the girl was a fine girl. She was a normal female. But subhanAllah, she got her monthly cycle when she was like 17, just about to enter 18. So imagine if this girl got married at 15 and then got divorced. What will we do? We will treat her as old women who don't have monthly cycles and she would stay for three months in her waiting period. So we have women who have monthly cycles, three monthly cycles. Women who are too old or too young to have menses, their waiting period is three months. Okay, what about if it is the third divorce? the monthly cycle is one or the idda period is one monthly cycle 
What about if the, 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 the judge himself dissolved the marriage or broke the marriage bond? The husband is in jail doing life and he doesn't want to divorce and he doesn't want to accept khula. In this case, the judge steps in, enforces divorce or separation. So the woman is to wait for one monthly cycle. The woman applies for khula and the husband agrees. She gives him the money, the dowry. How long she, should she wait? One monthly cycle. This is her idda period. A slave girl before being sold or once enslaved, part of the Sharia is that she must observe one monthly cycle before her master is able to be intimate with her as a concubine. And that if she were to be or to get pregnant would free her and make her a mother of a free boy or a free girl. And that would be to her advantage. And this, as we have talked about a lot before, was the norm in Christianity, in Judaism, in Buddhism, everywhere in the world. This was the norm when Islam was revealed. So there's no need to start talking negatively because this is found in the Bible. This is found in the Quran. So whether you accept these religions or not, this is your problem. But for the believers who are convinced that this is part of the religion with the fair and just conditions stated in the Quran and the Sunnah, we could care less what people say. Yet this is not our topic for today. So we spoke about when a person dies, what is the waiting period of his wife, of his widow, four months and 10 days. And if she is pregnant until she gives birth. And for a divorced woman, normally speaking, three monthly cycles, and if she's pregnant until she gives birth, if she does not have monthly cycles, then she should wait for three months. And if this was an irrevocable divorce, which is the third divorce, or if the marriage was broken due to khula or forced separation by the judge, or she was a concubine, then it's only one monthly cycle. And you have um, the evidences in front of you where inshallah you will be able to understand this a little bit more further. So we end up here and we go to the questions. And inshallah Azza wa Jal, hopefully with the grace of Allah on Saturday, today is Thursday, Next Saturday, two days from today, we will meet, inshallah, for a whole session of answering your emails and questions with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, bi idhnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, same time at 4.30 Mecca time. So it will be for an hour and it is on Saturday with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. So here is Rashid saying, a woman after taking khul'a, has to return the mahar dowry back. Please enlighten. Jazakallahu khairan. We've, we talked about this in the class of, of khul'a. And we said that the hadith of uh, Fatima bin Qais, who came, I think, I think it was Fatima bin Qais or someone else, um, who came, or actually she was someone else. Uh, she is the wife of Thabit bin Qais who came to the Prophet and said to him, I do not criticize Thabit in any moral conduct or religious commitment, meaning that he is 
one of the best companions of the Prophet ﷺ. However, I do not like kufr after Islam. Meaning that she is afraid that if she continues in this marriage, that she would commit kufr, which is minor kufr, for not being able to give him his rights due to the resentment she has towards him. Not due to sins or to bad conduct. It's simply there's no chemistry. She cannot continue in this marriage. So the Prophet said, والسلام, would you give him back his dowry? And his dowry was a piece of land, a farm. So she said, yes, I would. So the Prophet instructed Thabit by saying, divorce her. So this is khulr. Khulr is separation, consensual separation in exchange for financial compensation. So the husband has to take something in return for his approval of khulr. And this is a condition. If he does not take it, then this becomes a divorce. So if he says to her, all right, you want khulr? I divorce you. And he refuses to take any compensation. This is counted as a divorce, one of three. But if he says, okay, I agree for khulr and I agree to take in exchange uh, um, uh, this amount of money from your dowry. This counts as khulr and the three divorces are still intact. So they can get married later on without any problem. Now, this is khulr. Once awarded and the condition, which is the compensation, financial compensation, is received, it's irrevocable. The man cannot say, ah, uh, listen, I changed my mind. Let's get back together. No, this is final. You want to marry her? You have to take the consent and approval of her father. Her father has to check with her whether she wants to return to him or not. And then they would give a, um, a, um, a dowry in the presence of two male witnesses so it's a it's a full new marriage unlike revocable divorce he divorces her the first time or the second time and she's still in the idda period and he comes to her after three four weeks and says listen i reconcile with you you're my wife again the woman shouts and screams no i don't want to go back to you i don't want to become your wife you can't force me the judge says, yes, he can. You're still his wife. It is his right to give divorce and it is his right to reconcile without your permission. If you don't want to stay with him, apply for khulam. This is your God-given right. So I hope this, Rashid, answers your question. Suleiman says, is ulama do accept the social um, distancing in congregation of this present world so basically Suleiman's question is that is the issue of social distancing that we see in masjids is this acceptable this is an issue of dispute among scholars there are a number of major scholars of Islam of contemporary times who looked at this present calamity you see this is not considered to be something of the past which means that it is not something that was present at the time of the Prophet والسلام, the companions the tabi'een the tabi'i tabi'een we know that they were struck with the plague in some cities at some period of times of history yet we've never seen 
anyone innovating, if we were to say the word, or inventing, let us make it a little bit softer, the issue of social distancing. So the scholars of contemporary times had to come up with an opinion based on their knowledge of Quran and the Sunnah. Some of them said that as long as we can compromise prayer times by combining Asr to Dhuhr or Isha to Maghrib when it's raining, as long as we allow a worshiper to walk during his prayer to fill up a gap at the front, there are a number of things that we can use to reach a compromise that is accepted by medical doctors. So the doctors would say, yeah, this is okay to keep a gap of a meter and a half, etc. So some scholars say, yes, this is much better than boycotting the messages and closing the doors altogether. Other scholars said that, well, we may beg to differ because there was the plague at the time of the companions and none of them abandoned the Salat. And we know that the plague is far worse and more dangerous than the COVID-19 because the fatality in COVID-19 is 5%, which is not that huge. You're not talking about people dying like 50% of the population. You're talking about 5%. And this can happen due to old age, chronic illnesses, car accidents, cancer, you name it, we've got it. And this social distancing, why is it only implemented in masjids? Why isn't it implemented elsewhere? As we see people go to the supermarkets, they go to the fish market, they go to the gyms now, alhamdulillah, they go to malls, they travel in, through uh, um, airplanes and they're sitting one next to the other. Why is it, subhanAllah, when it comes to salah, to prayer, you enforce this? And some scholars say that no, there is no real necessity in Islam to call for such social distancing in Salat. Yes, if it was the plague, if it was smallpox, if it was something that is fatal and really dangerous, infectious, to the extent that, yes, a lot would die, then, yeah, maybe. But some prefer to pray home rather than, than to pray in this innovative fashion in the masjid. And they believe that when the Prophet says, Alaihissalam, whoever eats garlic or onions must not attend our masjids, they said that, okay, if I don't want to attend such an innovative way of prayer, by default, I'm in more excused status than the one who ate garlic or onion. So it's an issue of dispute that one is asked to look inside his own heart and come to a decision. And Allah Azza wa Jal, yani inshallah, would accept if a person is afraid to infect others or to be infected, or if a person is not comfortable with praying in such a way where he's isolated from other worshippers, wearing a mask, praying on his own prayer mat, as if he's praying alone, home, doesn't feel like praying in the masjid. So this is something that each one has to look into his, his, his own self and Allah knows best. Uh, Zinat says, what about a husband's family who used 
all of the furniture and kitchen appliances of their daughter-in-law without her permission and husband says nothing. Whenever daughter-in-law goes to her parents' house behind her, her in-laws sleeping on her furniture using everything and taking her dowry kitchen appliances in their kitchen. And when daughter-in-law and son moves to the U.S. and whenever they both visit, the father-in-law is using all the bedrooms set and they give other room for 15 days to their son and daughter-in-law. So basically Zinat is complaining of a scenario where it seems that they are living abroad in the US and they have a flat or a house of their own or maybe a suite in the family's house where before they migrated to the US her family gave her kitchen appliances, furniture, gifts. Maybe they gave her a dowry and the husband was a real man. He refused to take the dowry. So they changed it to her name and gave it to her. So she used that in the house. And when they left to the US, her in-laws so that such appliances which was or were used before by the whole family and she had no complaints because she was living with them at the time they started or continued to use them as before and as for the suite or the bedroom or the section of the house that was theirs it, they saw they thought that it was not appropriate to leave it for three four years unattended and instead they can use it whenever their second son comes with his family and he doesn't have a place in the home so she's complaining is this moral the answer is no however it is also unethical to have a part of their home reserved for you and your husband and your family and not to use anything without you telling them not to use it so out of courtesy usually people feel okay if people use their things especially if they were in the same house you should have told them that this is not to be used and locked the stuff in a storage room or a warehouse so that you ensure nobody uses it. You could have easily sold it and benefited from it if you are so sensitive of such an issue, which is not quite normal to tell you the truth because people usually are kind, people are generous, people take things easy they're not obsessive of their own things wanting to have it only for them and not to be shared with anyone you want this to happen this is your right don't leave your things lying around and tell people don't touch it I'll be coming after three years this is not logical maybe they are wrong in using it yes but you are also wrong in leaving your stuff behind unattended like this so if you want you can take all of your stuff when you go back next time sell it give it away as a gift burn it this is up to you but to cause tension between you and your husband over trivial things when Allah has substituted you with so many greater gifts and favors and blessings this is a little bit yani, too extreme Uthman says, kindly elaborate on the issues of commission one is getting from being a middleman between a buyer and a seller. If you are an independent person, meaning that you're not working for a company involved in such a transaction, so you know both parties A and B, 
A wants to buy something, B has that thing to sell. And you manage to make a deal between them or to be a catalyst in making the deal come to reality. So your commission is either taken from the seller or from the buyer or from both sides, depending on what you agree with them as a middleman. So A wants to buy it for a hundred thousand. And you say to him, okay, I'll try to negotiate a price of a hundred thousand, but you will give me 2.5% of the hundred thousand. If I succeed, he says, done deal. You go to B who wants to sell it for 95 and you tell him, okay, I'll sell it for 95. Maybe I will manage to make it up to a hundred thousand. Would you give me 2.5% if I succeed in raising the price this much? And the guy says, yeah, sure thing. So you arrange a meeting and they come and they sign. Both parties are happy. You get your commission. There's totally kosher and legit and there's nothing wrong in that inshallah. Why do I say that you don't work in a company? Because this would be a bribe. So if you're the head of the procurement department, that would be a, a bribe. If you are the head of the sales department and somebody is giving you money to cut some, them some slack, again, this is a bribe and this is not permissible. Zareen says, I try to pray regularly, but I discontinue. Please advise how can I devote myself towards praying? Wallahi, this is something that is extremely problematic, Zareen. The Prophet said والسلام, in an authentic hadith, العهد الذي بيننا وبينهم الصلاة. The pledge that is between us and them, that is the disbelievers, is salat, is prayer. In a narration, فمن تركها فقد كفر. Whoever abandons it, he has become a kafir, a disbeliever. And the Prophet says, and I think the hadith is in Sahih Imam Muslim, بين الرجل والكفر أو الشرك ترك الصلاة. Between man and disbelief or shirk is abandoning salat. So this and among other evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah called some scholars to say that whoever abandons one Salat deliberately without any justification or legitimate reason, he has exited the fold of Islam and became a Kafir and become a Kafir. And this is a serious sin to simply be a Kafir among the fire dwellers. Allah says in Surah Al-Muddathir, when the people of paradise look at the people of hell, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَخَرْ Why were you admitted to hellfire? So the people of hell justify this by four reasons. The first of all, they say, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We were not among those who used to pray. This is the first reason for them entering hellfire. So this is not something to be taken lightly and you just say it casually. Well, I am unable to discontinue. Um, I am able to continue praying regularly. So I leave it off and on. Uh, give me advice. What advice? You're going to hell if you continue doing this. So you have to get your act up together. You have to look for means and ways among the very most important means and ways is to associate yourself with righteous and practicing Muslims. You have to be surrounded by righteous practicing Muslims 24 hours, seven days a week. They will ensure that you keep on praying on time 
and becoming a better Muslim. May Allah guide you to the straight path. Halifax says, my question is, there is nothing like bride price in most of Western societies. So how Muslim men can get married to them? If you're getting married to another Muslim woman, then this is understood that this is her right in Islam, mentioned in the Quran, mentioned in the authentic Sunnah, and every family accept this and they have no problem with that. But if you're getting married to a Christian woman, and maybe this is what you're referring to, in this case, you have to propose to her father. You cannot marry her without her father proposing to you and saying, I give you my daughter in marriage. You may accept that marriage and you have to appoint a dowry, what you call a bride price. It is not to be sold. This is a dowry, a mahar, a sadaq. So you tell her father, listen, I'm giving her $5,000 and this is called dowry in Islam and this is her right. There is no problem even if they don't know it or they're not accustomed to it and Allah knows best. Um, Zaid Zubair says, can a woman give in marriage her fellow woman? Now, I'm thinking well of Zaid Zubair. I don't think he's meaning to marry of the same gender. No, this is unimaginable. So I don't think he's mentioning or meaning this. What I think he means is that can a woman give an act like a guardian to another woman? So in many cases, a mother wants to give her daughter in marriage to another man. So, so she says to the bride-to-be, I give you my daughter in marriage. And the man says, I accept her marriage in the presence of two male Muslims, men. So is this marriage valid? The answer is no. The guardian can never be anyone except a male man, Muslim, if she's a Muslim woman. But a woman can never be a guardian, even if she was her mother, grandmother, sister, neighbor, even if she, the, the bride is a revert Muslim who has no relatives, even her sister Muslima or a, a Muslim friend cannot be her guardian. This is totally um, out of the question. And Umar Farooq says, I'm from Bangladesh. My question is, do I have to pay or to pray Tahiyatul Masjid in a mosque where Jum'ah Salat is not prayed? Ah. So what is our friend Farooq's question? Farooq's question is regarding the issue of, is the Masjid a jami' or a normal masjid? What's the difference? The scholars of fiqh differentiated between a jami' masjid where there is a jumu'ah and a number of smaller masjids where they never pray Fridays. So some say that the smaller masjids, you should not perform i'tikaf in there because inevitably you have to leave and go to a masjid with a Friday to pray it and this would break your atikaf. So both masjids, if you enter it, you cannot sit down until you pray two rakahs. And this is known among the jurors as tahiyyatul masjid, the greeting of the masjid. And there isn't any such thing from the Prophet والسلام, stating that it should be um, called tahiyyatul masjid, any two rakahs. So if you pray Sunnah al-Fajr, the first time you enter the masjid, do I have to stand up and pray Tahit al-Masjid? No. These two, two rakahs of Sunnah al-Fajr suffice. And if you intend that this is also for my two rakahs of wudu, it suffices as well. And if you 